Hi, my name's Luke. I uh, live in Freiburg, uh, which is unceded occupied territory of the Abenaki, specifically a village that before colonization was known as Bequawket. I'm here today uh, to talk to you about water privatization. So what is privatization? It is the process of transferring uh, publicly stewarded and uh, owned assets and services uh, into private control of entities whose main priority is profit. Two primary examples of privatization in the context of water is the bulk water extraction and water systems privatization, which is the, the infrastructure that brings water from a certain body of water to your taps. Uh, most towns have local bodies uh, designed to regulate and uphold the service of bringing water to people's homes. Um, many water districts, however, face inadequate funding uh, across the U.S. Um, and are forced to consider privatization as an alternative. Water privatizing industries, unlike uh, these regulatory bodies, are not accountable to the people they serve because they are primarily interested in maximizing their profits. The question arises of who is in control of water sources when they are privatized. Privatizing water and sewer systems costs far more than the small financial benefit. It requires the relinquishing of local stewardship over water sources because, um, you know, local government officials yield their voice over such a vital public resource and the people lose their input with regards to the allocation of water. And now multinational corporations are becoming primarily account uh, primary um, possessors of water in, their, in these uh, communities. The bottom line is that water privatizers feed off of weak democratic institutions. It is how they thrive. They require that in order to extract large amounts of water and to privatize the, the very systems that people depend on to access water, that the people themselves have as little input as possible on, um, on the stewardship of those water sources. So like most issues we are here to address today, it is rooted in the genocide and displacement of indigenous peoples. My hometown, Freiburg, was once known as Pequawket in Abenaki territory. In 1725, scalp hunters from Massachusetts colony came to Pequawket with the sole purpose of murdering and removing the scalps of indigenous men and women and children. The tribe was nearly wiped out after a battle, ex with the exception of a very few. Who su the, the survivors mainly fled to Canada in what is now uh, the Odenak and Wolinak uh, nations and other Wabanaki tribes. And only one person on record is known to have remained in the area, and her name was Maliakit. She was a well-known medicine woman, and she traveled the area sharing indigenous knowledge and practices in medicine. And she built a relationship with a local family who had moved up from Massachusetts recent in that period, um, named the Rickers. Wentworth Ricker was a local hotel owner. And um, she built a relationship with him sharing local indigenous knowledge. And one such piece of knowledge was that there was a, a spring nearby. The water that came from it was known to have medicinal properties, uh, curing diphtheria and chronic stomach illness. And Wentworth became aware of this, and they would, the, the community would uh, take water from the spring when needed. And um, after Maliakit's passing, uh, Wentworth Ricker's son, who was aware of this, he bought the property that the spring was on, closed it off to the public, and established what is now known as Poland Spring in 1845. So Poland Spring, one of the first bottled water companies, oh, sorry. One of the first bottled water companies in the United States is founded upon the theft of indigenous knowledge and land. Before, 19, before the 1970s and 80s, bottled water was seen as an upper middle class phenomenon. It, wasn't, it was common sense that water was, you know, it came from people's taps. It wasn't, it wasn't something you needed to buy. And as you can see in these photos, it wasn't something that could be easily shipped and packaged on a large scale. But with the introduction of PET plastics, which could actually 
hold water. Um, P the, these companies were able to produce and distribute it on a massive scale. So they had to justify their, this, they had to justify, they had to create a demand for this new product because they saw the potential that bottled water had as a product. So I'd like to ask how many of you have heard uh, in, through advertising or in school that you need to drink 10 glasses of water per day? All right, that is in fact not true and only came about during the initial marketing uh, campaigns of the bottled water industry to justify this new product. So uh, Poland Spring, you know, it prides itself as this local company with such, you know, local history. But in fact, it was bought out in 1980 by Perrier, the French water company, and then at Nestle in 1992. So this brings us to where I got involved. In 2012, uh, Nestle had been, uh, Nestle, which owned Poland Spring at the time, uh, had been extracting water from Freiburg for over a decade. However, they wanted to secure a con they wanted uh, long-term security for that operation. So they saw a 45-year contract with our town's private water supplier. They did so without the consent nor knowledge of the local town's people. And at a t local town hearing when people caught wind of this and demanded a hearing, Dozens of people spoke in opposition to it. In fact, the building was full of opposition. They had to turn people away, and people were looking into the building from uh, outside in the windows. Um, only one person from the town spoke in favor of it, and it was someone who had financial interest in the contract. So a group of, and so the Public Utilities Commission ended up approving the contract, and a group of concerned citizens from Freiburg took it to court in what became a four-year-long legal battle. In 2016, we lost in the state Supreme Court. And though we were defeated in the most tangible and visible sense, it was in that four-year legal battle that we built a network of frontline communities who were dealing with similar issues with regards to their right to water that, was in, that we would consider a victory. So last year, uh, Nestle Waters North America sold all of their assets to uh, a pair of private equity firms operating as Blue Triton brands. Now the implications of this are significant, though it does not change the fundamental nature of the problem. Because private equity firms exist to flip assets and make their assets as profitable as possible. So unlike Nestle, they, do not, they are not accountable to any sort of public relations. They do not have a reputation to uphold. Though, of course, I'm sure many of you are aware of Nestle's rather awful uh, reputation across the globe. Um, so now we are dealing with uh, accelerated efforts to extract um, and profitize this, this precious resource that we all depend on. Blue Triton Brands now owns approximately 20,000 acres across the United States, 6,000 of which are in Maine. 3,000 of those 6,000 acres are right here in the Saco River watershed, which is uh, primarily in Oxford County. And we are also seeing severe uh, impacts on the local ecology as well from this bulk water extraction. Uh, this is Round Pond uh, near, uh, not too far from where the, uh, the bottle, from the, um, uh, Poland Spring facility is where they extract water from. And in, up until very recently, the water was, con was fairly consistently up to, the, uh, up to the vegetation line. And this is just to give you an idea of the geography of this. Um, you may have a hard time seeing, but the communities that are highlighted in blue are where Nestle or Poland Spring or Blue Triton currently has uh, extraction sites in Maine. Orange uh, highlighted areas are where are communities where their water systems have been privatized uh, under the ownership of the Maine Water Company, which is actually owned by, uh, which is actually based in Connecticut and under, uh, recently underwent a merger with the San Jose Water Company, which this merger makes it the third largest um, private water utility in the United States. So now water systems that people depend on here in Maine 
are now under the control of business executives across the country who have no stake in the communities they are supposedly serving. And these are the geographic areas surrounding the communities where these, bulk, these um, bulk water extraction sites are. Um, because as we know, water doesn't adhere to political boundaries. It has no regard for the boundaries that we set up. It doesn't follow town boundaries, state or national boundaries. So these are the areas that would be affected in the event of drought or the uh, extreme uh, stress on water sources due to bulk water extraction. And as you can see, that's about a fifth of the state of Maine. And as we know, the climate emergency is exacerbating water stress across the globe. There are other water issues in Maine that we work on that go hand in hand with privatization. Chief among them, indigenous sovereignty. I'm sure many of you heard, have heard about these issues. The Penobscot River case where the state has pursued ruthlessly to undermine the rights of the Penobscot tribe to the river. There is the Passamaquoddy tribe at Sabayak who has experienced a water crisis for 40 years where the water is undrinkable. I've been to Sabayak. I have tasted and smelled the water. It is a foul stench that does not leave your mind easily. It is unsafe. People have to travel up to 15 miles just to access water on a day-to-day -day basis. There is also the issue of Wabanaki tribal sovereignty. Tribal sovereignty is at the root of these issues, which the state has consistently denied and disrespected since, it, since, since its very establishment. The foundation of environmental justice is the liberation of indigenous peoples. As Lakota Sanborn clearly established on Friday night, there is also the issue of precious metals mining, which pose a clear and direct threat to the safety and security of our water sources. Prospective mining operations in Newry, which is right nearby, and Pembroke, primarily for lithium, silver, lead, and copper, pose severe threats to water sources, as it is one of the most destructive human activities. The Callahan Mine, for example, in, Brooks, in uh, Brooksville, Maine, closed in the 1970s, but still cost $750,000 a year for Maine taxpayers to pay to this day to contain the waste and to prevent it from poisoning surrounding water sources. And according the world, to the World Economic Forum, there is a 95% probability that future wars will be fought over water. Water justice the prevention of privatization and destruction of water sources is war prevention. We are clearly seeing already, thank you. We are clearly seeing already existing conflicts being exacerbated by water insecurity. Israel, Palestine, the occupation there. There, are, there is the India-Pakistan conflict. There are conflicts in Central America. People are dying not only because of a lack of access to water, but they're also dying fighting for access to water. Water insecurity is a global phenomenon, but so is resistance to privatization. And we must join that movement. The water commons is an idea. It's a model for a better future. It is the idea that water is no one's property, that what impacts one water source impacts everyone and everything that relies to it that relies on it. And we therefore need to envision a future that does no, not rely on market and state interests, but, by, but on community and mutualism. The concept of the commons is no new idea. It has been practiced in indigenous belief systems for millennia. So the question is, what can we do about it? I urge you to run for municipal office on a platform of water protection. You can also serve on a local water district. Adopt local water protection ordinances because this, the solution to this will not come from a top-down dynamic, but it will be in the communities that are affected that will be leading this charge to water justice. Pressure elected officials to adopt and maintain law, the legal infrastructure to protect public water stewardship, not privatization. We need to support progressive water policies for future generations. 
and question institutions with conflicts of interest who are benefiting financially and, other, and otherwise from water privatization. I would also urge that you support grassroots and youth-led environmental organizations because we are the ones who are going to be most impacted in the long term and we are the ones who have been tackling this issue for as long as we have been able. I would also urge that you follow Wabanaki-led media and organizations. Sunlight Media Collective has been providing consistent and reliable coverage of indigenous issues in Maine where the mainstream media has fallen short. I would also urge that you support Bomazine Land Trust, as Lakota mentioned on Friday night, which is the only Wabanaki-led land trust organization leading the charge to decolonize land conservation and reshape our relationship with the land we inhabit. For today, I would urge that because 1626, LD 1626, the bill that would effectively recognize tribal sovereignty on behalf of the, on the part of the state of Maine is on the Senate or is on the appropriations table. I would urge that you send an email and get in touch with any and all members of the appropriations committee and urge that the governor support and pass LD 1626. This is an immediate and crucial step that we can take to advance tribal sovereignty. So thank you. I appreciate you. Continue doing the amazing work you're all doing. I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you.